Welcome, terrific concrete people. My name is Tyler, and I'm going to be talking about T-beam design today. Lots of T's today. This is an episode where we talk about the theory, kind of how T-beams work, kind of what they're all about, okay? We'll have two more videos after this that will give you some example problems about T-beams. There are two principal reasons to use a T-beam. Number one, concrete is not very strong in tension. And so anything we have below the neutral axis is just going to crack. So why do we have it there? Because it's just going to add weight. If we're able to remove the majority of this material, like skinning it down, then we could still have the same amount of steel. We would just crack the concrete. And guess what? The capacity will be the same. And this is why T-beams are so awesome. In T-beam analysis or design, there are two distinct cases. And the secret to getting every one of these problems right is to figure out which case you're in. And the difference between the two cases is the depth of the compression block. Let me tell you what I mean. If your compression block is in the top flange, that means this little area appears in compression in the top flange. That would be your A, that's the depth of the compression block, is less than HF. HF is the height of the flange. If your A is less than HF, you're in case one. And ladies and gentlemen, this is just like a rectangular beam. It's like a rectangular beam with a huge flange and a very small web. It's easy. You already know how to do it. Previous videos will do one. Super simple though. If you're in case two, that is when your A, depth of the compression block, is greater than the height of your flange. So your compression block goes down partly into your web. This is a little bit harder to deal with, and it is not the most economical of shapes, and you should redesign this if you have the power to, but sometimes you don't have the power. We all want the power, right? So let's work these out and let's figure out how you would find the capacity. And case one, I told you, is just like a rectangular beam. There's nothing different. There's not, nothing fancy. We assume the strain at the top is 0.003. Why do we do that? Because it's a great assumption, because most concretes can get to 0.003 on the top. And we assume our strain at the bottom is greater than the yield strength and things are cracked. Very, very typical assumption. So we assume this is Fy. And there's our compression block at the top. And we have a compression resultant and we have a tension resultant. And now we go and solve. And then tension, what is it? ASFY. Now, if I sum the moments about the top, I will come up with this equation. And you should know what I'm talking about because you should have seen this before because this is the basis of how we do reinforced rectangular shaped concrete beams. But now let's go to case two. Let's get interesting. Let's get real. Now we've got this situation where we've got some of our compression block that has made it down inside the web. And our strain diagram still looks pretty similar. And our stress diagram still looks pretty similar. But now we have a different resultant. We've got a resultant for the compression for the flange, a resultant for that little bitty stuff down underneath it. We have these tension force at the bottom. We're going to set them equal. And I'll show you about more of this on the next page. So to make all this easier, to like make this simpler to do, we're going to break up our compression block into two parts. Okay. One is the flange area outside of the web, and the other is the web plus the remaining amount of the flange. You're like, what? Don't worry, I'll show you coming up. We're also going to break up our steel into two parts. That's why it's part two. Ha! Part one will exactly balance the compression caused by the flange outside of the web. And part two will exactly balance the compression caused by the web and the remaining flange. Confused you yet? Keep watching. Here we go. Now let's make it clear. What I'm saying is we're going to take this structure and we're going to break it up into two parts. That's part one. And then we're going to steal, we're going to steal part of the steel. Take part of the steel out. How much do we take? Just enough. Just enough so that this and this balance, the forces balance. 
if I take the resultant from these and I get C1, AS1 times FY. That stress, that load has to be equal. Then part two. Let's take part two. That's the stuff in the middle. We're going to take the remainder in the middle and the remaining amount of steel. How much steel? The steel I started with subtracted what I took out earlier. Great. Uh, this is my compression resultant. This is my tension resultant. This is my moment arm, D minus the height of the flange over 2. Point A, 5 times F prime C times B minus BW times the height of the flange. Okay. That is basically taking the volume of these blocks. Okay. The area multiplied by the stress, which is 0.85 times F prime C. Now, this is AS1 times FY. Now, let's go over and do part two. I'm going to do the same thing. Same exact same thing. I'm going to take the resultant from this, which is going to be C2, and this is going to be T2. And the compression resultant is 0.85 F prime C. That's the stress multiplied by BW. Why is it BW? Because it is the width of the web, and that is BW. And then what's T2? That's my remaining amount of area, AS minus AS1 times FY, and I get another resultant. Now, to find AS1, right, if we set these two equal, we can actually solve for AS1 and get the equation here. But the cool thing is I'm going to add this moment plus this moment, and I'm going to get the total moment capacity. So this just said in another way. This is only for case two. I'm going to break up my structure into two parts. Part one has the outside parts of the flange plus some of the steel. Part two has the remaining part of the flange, the remaining part of the stuff that's in compression, plus the remaining amount of steel. I'm basically going to solve for the moment that this gives me, and I get this. And then I'm going to solve for the moment that this gives me, and I get this. Then I'm going to combine them together to get my total moment. How awesome is that? So I know you're, you're out there. I know you're asking a really good question. Tyler, how do I know if I have case one or if I have case two? And ladies and gentlemen, I'm about to show you right now. What we're going to do is we're going to calculate this mythical A. This is an ideal A. This is, this is treating it as if it's a rectangular beam. And we're going to try to figure out how deep would the compression block be if it was... A rectangular beam. This is like a unicorn. Yeah, this isn't real, right? I mean, if unicorns are real, I'd love to meet one and see one and touch one and pet one, and that would be totally like amazing and awesome, right? Because they're not real. At least I don't think they're real, okay? But this is not real. This is like a mythical thought. We're thinking that this is a helpful tool to figure out if we're case one or case two. So we're going to calculate our A, and then we compare it to the height of our flange. And if our A is less than our total height of our flange, then we are in case one. If our A is greater than our height of our flange, then we are in case two. So we're comparing our mythical A to our actual height of our flange. And that will tell us if we're in case one or case two. And remember, if you're in case one, the rectangular beam, the old school, simple, no problem, way it works great if you're in case two it's not that challenge it's not that bad it's not that bad at all okay i solve for an as1 first i find an mn1 i plug in here i find an mn2 i plug in here where the a is now this this is now the a that i'm going to use in this equation and here is our mn1 plus mn2 here is our total moment capacity that's how you solve for t-beams I want to say a big thanks to Arthur Martin and Hanny Brown, especially Hanny. He's a binge watcher. I love you, Hanny. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for watching my videos. Please like them, subscribe to them, tell your friends about them, like tell your enemies about them. Maybe they'll watch them too. Maybe it'll make them better. I don't know. Take care. See you next time.